The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, Richard D. Collenberg on the limits of white identity politics. Joshua A. Douglas on the growing movement for voting rights reform. Plus, Bill Press with a progressive perspective on U.S.-Israeli relations. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Richard Collenberg is a scholar who has written extensively on the interplay of race and class in education. He has been called the intellectual father of the economic integration movement in schooling. In a recent book review, he takes on the issue of white identity, its influence on American politics, and the need for a national identity and politics that bridge racial divides. And we say hello to Richard Collenberg, a senior fellow at the Century Foundation and the author of All Together Now, Creating Middle Class Schools Through Public School Choice. He's also working on a book on economic segregation in housing and education. Richard Collenberg, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Our pleasure to be speaking with you. You recently reviewed a new book by Duke political scientist Ashley Jardina, and it's called White Identity Politics. And in part, you identify what we learn from her research, among other things, that high white identity doesn't always mean working class. Where else do we see it? Uh, well, Jardina found, finds that we see white, high white identity uh, across the white population. So it's it's pervasive. About 30 to 40 percent of Americans, uh, white Americans, have high levels of white identity, meaning they feel strongly attached to their their whiteness. Uh, And it includes upper middle class whites as well as working class whites. Uh, And in fact, uh, interestingly, a disproportionate share of women have high white identity uh, in part, maybe because they're more, uh, as a group, are more uh, community oriented in general, as opposed to in- individualistic. Well, and then another finding of the book that you identify is that white identity doesn't always mean racist. Can you explain that? Sure. This is probably uh, Ashley Journey's Dina's most important finding. So she. Uh, through survey research, suggests that about 9% of whites are really hardcore racist. I mean, these are people who sympathize with the Ku Klux Klan and, um, and you know, would in no way be part of progressive politics. Uh, but there's this mar- much larger group, 30 to 40% of whites, who have what uh, Jardina calls uh, in-group affinity, uh, as opposed to outgroup hostility. So, um, you know, one can understand that distinction in the context of, of religion. You know, lots of people have a particular affinity towards their religious group, uh, if they're Jews or Christians or Muslims, without feeling hostility towards other religions. And and that's what uh, Jardina finds is is pretty common among, among whites. Mm-hmm. Now, Even if white identity, Richard, does not have to translate into racism, in many cases it does. But from your reading of the book, what is your sense of the different experiences between those who center their sense of whiteness around that out-group hate, if you will, as opposed to in-group love? Right. So uh, the the in-group love is obviously better uh, than than outgroup hate no one no one wants to endorse any kind of hate uh, but the in-group love is also problematic uh, given our our history of, of racism and segregation in this country uh, whites have disproportionate power and wealth in American society 
So it's it's concerning even when white people have an in-group bias. Uh, so that is to say, it might be okay if all groups had equal power and wealth, then, um, then the in-group bias might not be so problematic. But given the history of this country, even having that in-group love among whites is, is, is troubling. Now, let's talk politics. Uh, Republicans and Democrats certainly differ in the ways they appeal to whiteness. And in talking about Donald Trump, we often hear about dog whistle politics. Why does this work so well for him? Uh, well, I, I think the dog whistle worked worked well for Trump uh, in getting elected, uh, in part because white working class voters felt felt neglected by by both the parties. Um, so if if Democrats were seen as a party that was particularly focused on championing um, uh, immigrants and, and people of color, uh, I should add, as it should be, uh, then um, then Republicans were seen as, as traditionally favoring the rich. And, and Trump fed into this by saying he was going to do something different. He was going to be for the, uh, the forgotten uh, white working class. And I, I think there was something to the idea that white working class voters were were forgotten. Um, of course, once elected, uh, you know, Donald Trump promptly forgot uh, the the white working class voters himself and, you know, past tax credits for the rich and and the rest. Um, I think the only silver lining here is that Trump's really overt racism today seems to uh, to lack political appeal and he's getting pushed back. I mean, he's got unemployment at three percent, relatively high growth in the economy, you know, a, a, an incumbent president in that position should normally cruise to reelection, but but people are so disgusted by his his, his racism and his um, uh, general obnoxiousness, I think that they uh, they're, they're they're not providing that support today. I find it hard to watch him uh, at all, and you know you want to know what's going on, you want to follow what's going on, but I just the sight of him and as as he opens his mouth, I I many times just have to turn away, which is that's too bad. Um, and it's not yeah. just that's not just about being a, a Republican or a Democrat. That's just about being a person. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll, 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 let me get off my soapbox and we'll get back to you. <laughs> when, <laughs> when, when Democrats talk about whiteness, they usually say something like working class. Are they missing an opportunity to build on a more progressive and inclusive experience of white identity? Uh, I, yes, a more inc- inclusive experience of identity, although I, I, I hope we'll get away from, from white identity. Um, so uh, uh, I think the, the main point here is progressives should appeal to working class identity. And that would bring together working class African-Americans, working class Latinos, working class whites, uh, you, you know, in, in, in the book review, I, I cite uh, the, the segregationist uh, white supremacist Senator John C. Calhoun from the 19th century, who argued that the big divide in society was not rich and poor, but black and white. I mean, that, that's how conservatives have always liked to divide up uh, society, because that works for them. If, uh, you know, when, when white working class people vote their race, uh, then... Republicans tend to win when they vote their class, uh, then progressives are more likely to be successful. So so I think the, the real need here is for progressives to instill working class identity that that helps bridge these racial divides uh, that the that Republicans have tried to exploit for so long. We're speaking with Richard Collenberg, a senior fellow at the Century Foundation and the author of All Together Now, Creating Middle Class Schools Through Public School Choice. Richard, you make some very concrete suggestions on how progressive Democrats could not only promote a more progressive sense of well, not just white identity, but identity, but also benefit politically. First, you suggest more education on the roots of racial inequality. Why is that so important? Well, I think it's it's important from a moral perspective. 
uh, to make sure that that we all recognize our our privileges, whether based on race or religion or uh, or class, uh, and that's just part of what what um, uh, uh, any public figure should be doing. Uh, having said that, if we focus only on trying to kind of educate whites about their privilege, I think that's unlikely to be effective. Uh, Ashley Jardina has some research in her book to suggest that uh, many white people uh, already know that they're privileged, and and unfortunately, they kind of like it, right? They 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 don't want to give that up. Um, and so, so simply educating them, I don't think, uh, will, will be, will be enough. You know, I, I kind of want to touch back on, on something you mentioned a moment ago. You, could you also speak to the value of emphasizing economic justice over racial, racial preferences? How does this not turn into giving up on the goal of racial equality? Yeah, that's, that's a very important question. Um, I think the, we, we want to, make sure that we are addressing issues of racial inequality, uh, discrimination. It would be a mistake to simply avoid those issues of race in order to gain political, uh, uh, you know, uh, political appeal among working class whites. We have to confront racism directly. Having said that, when, when we're talking about racial preferences, and this is like in college admissions, giving a, a big boost to uh, African American and Latino students, I, I think there's a better way to get to the goal, the important goal of racial and ethnic diversity on campus, uh, and that is to give a a benefit to all students who've overcome economic obstacles. So a a disproportionate share of those students are are going to be African American and Latino. And uh, and so they will disproportionately benefit from economic affirmative action. Uh, but there are there are ways to reach the goal of racial inclusion that that are are less divisive than than using racial preferences per se. Now, you also wrote about the need to promote an inclusive American identity in terms of actual policy ideas. What does this look like? Yes. Well, uh, if we well, there's lots of research uh, in in Jardina's book about the importance of identity. So everyone has a strong need to identify with uh, with some group, and so if we're trying to wean uh, white working class people in particular off of this kind of pernicious white identity politics. There has to be something put in place, a different sort of identity uh, that is uh, that people can can feel um, passionately about. So it's not enough to be just transactional and say we're going to provide more money you know, we're going to put more money in your your pockets. I mean that's that's important, of course, but we need some identity and uh, as well. And and for many years, uh, you know, John Kennedy and others appeal to a patriotic American identity. And we can do that through our, our public education system by uh, recognizing the, the problems we've had in American society with racism and sexism and homophobia, uh, but also talking about the greatness of American democracy, that, that we, uh, because the genius of democracy is that when we had segregation, uh, there was a the ability of people to organize a civil rights movement. You know, when women were denied the vote, there was the ability to uh, uh, organize women to to get uh, and fight for their their rights. That those democratic values are are important, and and in that way we can can instill American identity. The other concrete way we can do it is is through a national service program. So there are a number of People on both the left and the right who for years have have talked about the importance of uh, instilling a strong, positive American identity around national service so that people can can feel like they're contributing to something bigger than themselves. And and I think uh, that would that would be a, a really powerful way to fight this um, destructive white identity politics with with something better an American identity politics. You mentioned Kennedy, and, and I recall when we last spoke, 
you you talked about another piece that you wrote about the inclusive populism of Robert F. Kennedy. What did he understand that we may be missing right now? Well, I, that, that's right. And I enjoyed our conversation earlier. Uh, Bobby Kennedy understood that working class people of all races uh, had more in common uh, than they had uh, differences. Uh, that is to say, Senator Calhoun was wrong. The great divide is not uh, uh, race, but, but class. And, and our politics ought to reflect that. And uh, Bobby Kennedy came back to that theme time and time again. He had a powerful economic populism uh, that was very different than Donald Trump's uh, you know, wasn't in any way racist. It was inclusive, uh, but but did recognize that that working class people of all colors faced obstacles, and they needed some some support to to enjoy the American dream. And as a result, you had uh, African American and Latino voters flocking to Robert Kennedy, but also you had working class white voters who had voted for George Wallace, the, you know, the segregationist governor, was, was open to, to Kennedy, even though he was a champion of civil rights, because they felt uh, that, that they, they were being heard uh, by him as well. And so, so that's what I think we want to try to, to aim for, uh, an inclusive populism that, that centers around uh, a, a pride in, in what American democracy can do. History teaches us lessons all the time, and that's certainly one that we could we could learn from uh, right now. Richard Kallenberg, senior fellow at the Center, Century Foundation and the author of All Together Now, Creating Middle Class Schools Through Public School Choice, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Richard, as always, we appreciate your time with us and look forward to speaking again with you soon. Likewise. Thank you so much, Jim. You're quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This social security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, reasons to be hopeful about the future of voting. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. There's a hunter's nightmare in which a group of them flush some rabbits out of the brush. But rather than scampering away, the furry bunnies turn toward their stalkers. Run, shouts one of the hunters. Run for your life. The rabbits have guns. Arming animals would make the sport of hunting a bit more sporting, wouldn't it? Well, what if we did give all wildlife a fighting chance against the destructive firepower of profiteers who so carelessly ravage their habitats and kill them off? Of course, we can't arm nature with guns, but we could recognize that other species and ecosystems are living creatures with intrinsic legal rights to exist and flourish, thus giving nature its day in court to defend its own well-being. 
Like us humans, the lakes, forests, wildlife, etc., could have legal status to sue and be represented by lawyers to protect themselves from mindless exploitation, injury, and death. This rights of nature concept is already being applied in such countries as Ecuador and New Zealand, and more than three dozen U.S. cities and towns have passed ordinances acknowledging that various natural resources in their areas have inherent rights to take polluters and other despoilers to court. Ironically, the corporate powers, who have perverted law, logic, and nature to have their lifeless profiteering entities declared persons, are aghast that Mother Nature can have rights that can counter the corporate claim that their right to profit is absolute. This is Jim Hightower saying, At its core, the rights of nature movement is asserting the obvious. Earth's biosphere is not a free candy store for our taking. We are one with the natural world and must find ways to cooperate fully with it for our own survival. To learn more and connect to action, go to Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, www.celdf.org, celdf.org. Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Amid dire news about our broken electoral system and efforts to suppress American voters, a new book from Joshua A. Douglas offers an optimistic view drawn from the stories of people across the nation fighting for free and fair elections. And we say hello to Professor Joshua A. Douglas. He is the Thomas P. Lewis Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. He's also the author of Vote for Us, How to Take Back Our Elections and Change the Future of Voting. Josh Douglas, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure to have you with us. Why was this an important book? Uh, why was this an important book to write now? Well, there's so much doom and gloom out there when it comes to the right to vote. You know, there's a sense that voter suppression has taken over, that it's harder to participate, that our system is less democratic. And many of the the turnout numbers demonstrate that, you know, we have woefully low turnout. And yet I learned through my research that there's a lot of good news out there about positive enhancements, about ways to make the system better and more inclusive. And I wanted to write about that. Well, and, and it's an optimistic book about activists who have fought for the right to vote and continued to do so. So what drives that fight? I think the sense that America has always been a a system of fits and starts, of possibility, of voter expansions. And, you know, we're at a time period now where we still have kind of this latent but still ever-present voter suppression. And we're not talking about the good news out there because people don't feel like there's good news. Uh, And yet I think the good news is what's going to drive us to move forward to actually fix our system. And, And I do think it's possible we have to start somewhere. And, you know, that means we have to start. And, you know, it's, it's hard to find any good news in the news today, but there's enough of it out there that you'd think someone would start bringing it up in the news cycles. Uh, now, as you look out at the landscape of voting rights in our nation, what are your biggest concerns about voter suppression and how do you understand the motivation behind those efforts? You know, I think the biggest concern, Jim, is that the politicians are still trying to rig the rules of the game to keep themselves in office. And our system has become anti-democratic in many ways, a small d democratic, because of issues like gerrymandering, uh, the practice of drawing district lines to uh, keep people in office and the politicians to choose their own voters, the practice of campaign finance rules that make it such that the wealthy interests seem to have uh, the biggest say. The problem of low voter apathy, which leads people not to turn out because they think that their vote won't make a difference. Um, These are all systematic problems in our democracy, and that's not even getting into the concerns of foreign interference and all of that. I just think we have a problem here at home of people not feeling like our system is uh, is working for them and that their voice voice won't matter because the entrenched moneyed interests win the day. And I think we need to combat that, and we have to do it at the grassroots local level. And, And we saw plenty of signs of suppression during the 2016 election in a couple of different places. And 
you know, I, I think it's obvious why people sometimes get discouraged when you see the news comes out about these kinds of things. Now, Josh, you write that if we are only engaged in the fight against suppression, quote, we are only doing half of what's possible, close quote. Expand on that idea, if you would. Yeah, so we spend so much time, and I think necessary time, working against this voter suppression, whether it's strict photo identification laws or proof of citizenship requirements, or as I already mentioned, uh, gerrymandering, all are forms to make it harder for people to vote or to try to rig the system for one side to win. Um, and so we spend so much time spinning our wheels fighting that, and that's vitally important work. My concern is that it's almost like we're playing whack-a-mole. You know, we beat back one form of voter suppression and another one pops up in its place. And so we're spinning our wheels and not moving forward with progress for enhanced voter participation and enhanced democratic institutions because we're so focused on the latest abuse. And unfortunately, the people who are in power and are rigging the system to create rules to help themselves have us playing defense so much. And so I think we need to continue that fight, but we have to take it a step further and also promote what I've referred to in the book as positive voting rights reforms, ways to bring more people into the democratic process, to make it more inclusive, to make it easier to vote so that we can also move forward. We can also play offense. And I think these are a dual strategy. It is a dual strategy that is uh, that we need to undertake. And we can't just focus on the latest abuse. We also have to go on the offense. Well, are we looking at it in too finite a way and not looking at the bigger, pic- bigger, broader picture then? Well, I'm not sure that we're looking at it in a finite way. I just think it's easy to get so upset at the latest abuse. You know, even when we have victories like uh, Florida voters approving a state constitutional amendment to reenfranchise 1.4 million returning citizens, people who had lost the right to vote for life because of a felony conviction, we see the state legislature and the governor pass a law to try to cut back on that. So even amidst our wins, it's easy to get so upset at these blatant efforts at suppression. Um, And my message here is you can't get discouraged. You have to fight back against those, but you also have to continue the march forward. Because honestly, our history has been one of over 200 years of forward progress when it comes to voting rights. We can't be back on our heels just because the latest round of suppression seems to get us so discouraged. We're speaking with Professor Joshua A. Douglas, the Thomas P. Lewis Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. He is the author of Vote for Us, How to Take Back Our Elections and Change the Future of Voting. And Josh, you profile several people in the book and open with the story of West Powell. Tell us about him and what we can learn from his story. Yeah, West uh, Powell is such an inspiring individual, and it demonstrates the power of one person speaking out. So about 25 years ago, West uh, made a dumb mistake. He broke into an auto salvage yard and stole a car radio, and he was caught and convicted of a felony of theft. And because he's in Kentucky, he lost the right to vote for life because of his felony conviction. And, you know, once he finished his, his sentence, he basically said, you know, I know I need to clean up my life. What am I doing with myself? I'm not a criminal. And so he uh, tried to get a job, actually had a hard time because of his felony conviction. So he opened his own computer repair shop and was very successful. He met a woman and got married and uh, started a family, had five kids. And yet he said he felt like he couldn't still feel be a part of society. He couldn't really feel a sense of his community because he had lost the right to vote for life. So 25 years later, he went to testify before the Kentucky State Judiciary Committee, excuse me, the Kentucky Senate Judiciary Committee, that was considering a bill to allow some lower level felons to get an expungement of their records, to get the, the felony wiped off their record. And he told his story. He spoke for about four and a half minutes, you know, kind of soft spoken. He said, my name is Wes Powell. I made a mistake a long time ago. I think I paid for that mistake five times over. What more do you want me to do? Uh, and in the room that day was a Republican senator named Whitney Westerfield, who had said he was opposed to felony expungement, that, you know, felons committed a crime and violated the social contract and nothing would change his mind. But then he heard Wes Powell's testimony. He heard him speak and it really put a face to the problem. And Westerfield changed his mind on the spot. And he was texting fellow Republican legislators and saying, we're going to fix this. We're going to get this done. And they did. They passed a bipartisan law to allow some lower level felons to get an expungement of their records, to wipe it clean and regain the right to vote. Um, And this wouldn't have happened if someone like Wes Powell hadn't 
spoken up and, and just told his story. And I think this really demonstrates the power of an everyday American to change the whole scope of democracy. Kentucky, with the worst felon disenfranchisement law in the country, made this law just a little bit better because someone like Wes Powell told his story and someone like Whitney Westerfield was willing to listen. Well, and, and as you termed it, there was a face to the story all of a sudden, and it became somewhat of a different issue, I think. Now, Josh, one of the issues you focus on in the book is accessibility. What are the simple obstacles many voters encounter on voting day and what solutions hold promise to overcome them? Yeah, you know, we don't talk a lot about voters with disabilities, but the statistics are really fascinating and disturbing that, you know, those with disabilities, um, you know, whether it's blind, deaf, mobility impaired or what have you, um, have lower turnout and, and a significantly lower turnout. And, you know, there, the accessibilities include just access to the polls themselves, whether it's, you know, through getting to the actual polling place or whether it's using the polling machine. I tell a story about one of my former students who's blind who told me that he waited 45 minutes in line to vote because the poll workers couldn't figure out how to turn on the one accessible voting machine that they had at his precinct. And so not only did he have to wait, but all the voters behind him were waiting in line as well. Um, there are solutions out there. One of the ones I talk about is a voting machine that anyone can use, regardless of ability or disability. Uh, it's called Prime 3, or the researchers at the University of Florida called it that, and it's actually used in some New Hampshire counties, and they called it all for one. And the system, the voting system is, you know, anyone shows up, whether you have no disability whatsoever or any kind of disability, you can all vote on the same type of voting apparatus. And so this reduces the stigma of having to request the accessible machine, hope that the poll workers know how to use it. Um, and so I think this holds real promise, uh, among other ways to make the voting system more accessible for everybody. And you also devote an entire chapter to ranked choice voting. Why is this such an important strategy? Yeah, ranked choice voting is really interesting. This is a different way to vote where instead of voting for one particular candidate among many, uh, you can rank order your preferences uh, like this person first, this person second, this person third. So imagine, if you will, if there was some important uh, office that people were running for. Let's say there are 24 candidates and coming up with a number there. And, uh, you know, we, people were trying to figure out who to vote for. Uh, instead of having to just choose one, you could say, like, this person first, second, third, et cetera. What it does is it opens up choices for voters. No longer do you feel like you have to vote for the lesser of two evils. Um, it uh, makes the campaigns a lot more positive, actually, because instead of slinging mud at your opponent, you're going to hope to get, you know, even if you can't get that person's first choice votes for the people who support them, maybe you can get their supporters to vote for you second, which might make a difference in the counting system. It also has proven to improve turnout and outcomes for minority voters and minority candidates. There's a lot of great benefits. This started, well, actually, we used to use ranked choice voting decades ago in places like Cincinnati. But it's the modern era started in 2002 in San Francisco, uh, thanks largely to an individual I profile named Stephen Hill, who uh, would go to bars at night in San Francisco and gather the attention of the crowd and say, hey, let's all rank order our favorite beers to demonstrate the power of uh, and the ability, the ease of, of doing so. Uh, it spread to places like Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, now Maine uses it statewide uh, in the last congressional election to great success. The voters seem to love it. Uh, it makes our system uh, just a lot more, a lot better because it gives people more choices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I prefer it. I, I think it's a great idea, and I'd like to see that go nationwide. You know, and the other thing that's really, if I just add one more thing about the ranked choice voting, it's a great example of a, a local innovation, something that starts at the city level and then spreads to other cities and then eventually gets adopted statewide. So we've had a lot of success with ranked choice voting all starting from one city doing it. And this, I think, is a really great model for positive voting rights reforms that can start at the local level and then spread further. And there's incentive to get involved when it's set up that way, in my opinion. And that's the thing. You, you have more people that might not otherwise vote who have a little more incentive because, all right, now I don't have to choose one. Here are all of my choices. Absolutely. And, and the places have, have seen higher turnout that have used it. All right. Now, Josh, there are so many stories in the book about efforts to protect and expand the franchise, and we can hardly recount them all in one interview. What are some of the innovations and fights that we should really be paying attention to? Well, one, I think, is this fight against gerrymandering, especially with the U.S. Supreme Court saying that the federal courts are not open for claims that partisan gerrymandering is unconstitutional. And yet we've seen successes at both the local and the statewide level 
to adopt independent redistricting commissions. Uh, I tell the story of Katie Fahey from Michigan, who really changed the scope of democracy in her state from a single Facebook post. She started a movement by posting on Facebook and saying, hey, I think um, I want to you know, get involved and try to prevent gerrymandering. Who wants to help? And this you know, just started spreading and snowballing, and they passed the state constitutional amendment to create an independent redistricting commission. I think on the campaign finance level, uh, something to watch is democracy democracy vouchers, with the, which they use in uh, Seattle, where every voter is automatically sent a $25 or four $25 vouchers to give to a candidate of choice uh, who has opted into public financing. And this can help to reduce the influence of big money. Um, I think election day convenience, things like universal vote by mail or vote at home, which is spread to, to five states now, uh, where every voter automatically receives a ballot in the mail without even requesting it. And that is proven to improve turnout. And that's something else to watch. And the final thing I'll mention very quickly is civics education. You know, I wrote a whole chapter about civics education because I think it's so important to the health of our democracy. And I learned some amazing things about these incredible social studies teachers and what they're doing in the classroom. And I think that's something to to focus on. And sadly, it's not hard to find people who do not vote simply because they have given up on the whole idea. You know, it's the it's all rigged anyway, you might hear. How do you respond to that? I you know, there's a couple ways to respond. You know, one is, are you happy with the current state of our politics? And if the answer is no, then you have to have a voice. Um, you know, I have a bumper sticker on my office door that says, if you don't want, vote, don't whine. And, and you know, people will say, okay, yeah, fine, I won't whine about it. You know, I, I can't deal with politics, but it affects so many different things. The other thing is that so many elections, especially local or smaller elections, can come down to one vote. You know, the entire control of the Virginia uh, state delegation uh, or the, the legislature there came down to one district uh, in the last election. And that in turn came down, one district came down to one vote. So it actually can make a huge difference. You know, the other thing is I think we need to engage young people. I have a, a chapter that I talk about lowering the voting age to 16, at least for local elections. I think this has immense power because you know, one of the reasons that people don't vote is uh, because they didn't vote previously. Voting is habit forming and non-voting is a habit as, as well. So, you know, studies show that if you miss the first election when you're an eligible voter, you're much more likely to become a habitual non-voter in the future. So if we lower the voting age to 16 when we have people you know, sort of captured and in high school. We improve civics education. We can actually create a whole new generation of engaged voters. And for the people who are apathetic, I'd say, look at the young people in this country and what they're doing. It's really inspiring. Professor Joshua A. Douglas, Thomas P. Lewis Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. He's the author of Vote for Us, How to Take Back Our Elections and Change the Future of Voting. Joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Josh, as always, we appreciate your time with us today and look forward to having you back again with us soon. That'd be great. Thanks so much, Jim. You're quite welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press on why criticism of Israel is not anti-Semitism and voting for Democrats is not disloyal. Hi, Bill. Thanks so much for having us. Good to see you. And Ori Neer is Director of Communications and Public Engagement for Americans for Peace Now and host of their podcast, PeaceCast. Hi, Ori. Welcome. Hi, Bill. Thanks for inviting us. Our, our po- podcast is available on all the platforms, and it's a podcast that focuses on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and efforts to resolve it. As far as I know, it's the only one that has this specific focus. Very good, and good to have you both here. Let me just ask, uh, back up and start. What is the mission of Americans for Peace now? When were you started? What are your goals? What What's the organization all about? Okay, so we're the sister organization of Israel's peace movement, Shalom Achshav, Peace Now. Uh, Americans for Peace Now was started in the early 80s, just several years after Peace Now was started. Peace Now uh, started in 1978 
or 77 actually, when uh, the president of Egypt at the time, Anwar Sadat, extended his hand in peace mm-hmm. to Israel. The Israeli establishment, political and military, was reluctant, and a group of Israeli officers, military officers, gathered together and put pressure in the form of an open letter on then Prime Minister Menachem Begin to reciprocate and sign peace with Egypt. We know that uh, the rest is history, as they they say, Israel did sign a peace agreement with Egypt. That movement, that that, uh, nucleus of uh, retired Israeli officers, morphed into a peace movement called Shalom Achshav, Peace Now. Uh, Americans for Peace Now started as a friends of in the early 80s and then developed into an independent American Jewish organization that advocates and educates for Israeli-Palestinian peace. Right. What is the status of the peace movement today, both in Israel and here in the United States, Deborah? Well, uh, the peace movement in Israel is still uh, it's still alive and kicking. It is it's not as strong uh, as it was when it was a, a mass movement uh, that that began, as Ori indicated, in the late 1970s, um, and was able to mobilize uh, really significant numbers of Israelis to come out in the streets and push for. Uh, for peace with Egypt and um, and an end to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, after many years at this point, I mean, since uh, Begin came to power in 1977, for the vast majority of that time up until now, Israel has been under right-wing rule. Uh, and um, there are many reasons that we could talk about, but um, in part because of that, uh, we've, we've seen... Uh, a, a diminution in the strength of the Israeli peace movement, but it certainly very much still exists, uh, both uh, in our sister organization Peace Now and other uh, left-wing uh, peace organizations, in left-wing and not just left-wing, mm-hmm. we should say, uh, peace organizations um, in Israel. We here uh, at Americans for Peace Now feel that it is extremely important uh, for progressives in the United States to support our natural allies in Israel. So when we talk about U.S.-Israeli relations, uh, what we want to do is to empower progressives, uh, to, um, voices that support peace in Israel uh, at a time you know that is that's extremely difficult for them. I think here in the United States. Um, particularly in in the era of Donald Trump, we are seeing a real resurgence uh, in terms of uh, particularly the Jewish community uh, and their uh, de- their willingness to to speak out against uh, the Netanyahu government. Uh, and our position would be that the the best way to do that would be to work together with and empower uh, those of our natural allies in Israel who are, you know, who are working against extremely difficult conditions. Well, that raises an inter- interesting question, right? I mean, yeah. uh, which I, I, uh, ask both of you, Ari, is it okay to criticize the politics or the policies of Benjamin Netanyahu? I think it's more than okay. I think it's an imperative. For an American to do it. For so. an American to do it, for an, for an American Jew to do it, for anyone who cares about the Israel's future, because I think that, that Netanyahu is taking Israel in directions that are d- destructive and, and disastrous. So to criticize Israel and to criticize publicly Israel, to criticize the government of Israel, yes, the right. leader of Israel, uh, is definitely something that is... That is, I think, uh, the right thing to do, the responsible thing to do. Well, Deborah, I remember being in Israel. I was stunned to see the level of criticism publicly, openly, strongly in the Israeli press. Oh. Uh, I mean, they're pretty wild, right? I mean, <laughs> even more so than the U.S. press Absolutely. against a U.S. president. I mean, is, Uri is actually the better person to speak up because he's actually a longtime Israeli journalist. Uh, so he he would be a great person to speak out on this. Um, and he can, he can talk more about it. I would just say that, A, you're right. B, Netanyahu is doing everything he can to try to undermine that free press. Um, but... I, I do want to go back to your original question. Is it is it okay for an American to criticize Israel? Um, and Ori responded, you know, of course, I agree with what Ori said, that it's imperative. And he mentioned it's imperative, particularly for American Jews. But, you know, it's easier for us as American Jews 
um, to criticize Israel and the Israeli government because our, you know, while while Donald Trump would criticize our, you know, question our loyalty, he's obviously, uh, you know, not afraid to go there. No, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that. But you know, we, you know, the fact that, for example, Bernie Sanders is uh, more vociferous in his criticism of the Israeli government, I think, you know, partly has to do with Bernie and his ideology. But there is something interesting there that the one, you know, Jewish candidate in the race is the clearly the most critical. And, you know, and the way that he's been doing it is to say, I'm Jewish. I have family in Israel. I worked on a kibbutz. But my point is, my point is, it's not only OK for Jews, for American Jews to criticize, for mm -hmm. Israelis, for Americans to criticize the Israeli government. It is OK and imperative, period. I was recently on a um, on a, a talk program. Uh, one of the fellow guests was a Palestinian American activist named Omar Badar, who works at the Arab American Institute. And within short order, he was accused by one of the Israeli guests of being an anti-Semite because he used the word occupation. And he mentioned the fact that the United States gives Israel billions of dollars of aid a year. I mean, these things are incontestable. They are simply facts. And that's absolutely wrong. I and I I'm I feel fortunate that I was there as as an American Jew to basically say, hey, that's that's ridiculous. It is absolutely not OK to call him an anti-Semite uh, because he mentions facts. Uh, you know, and I think, again, as, as Jews, we have a certain privilege in that regard. But I think it's incumbent on everyone, on all presidential candidates, for example, to speak truth and to know that it's OK and incumbent upon them to criticize the Israeli government. Couldn't one, I'm not an expert in this area, but couldn't one also make the point that being a Palestinian, he is also a Semite? No, isn't that true? <laughs> thought so. uh, that but, is so, true. That but, is true. So, Ori, you didn't hold back, right? Um, but as Deborah gets to, it's become almost a cliche now that anybody criticizes Netanyahu, they're accused of being anti-Semitic. I know. and that's I've, I've had that happen to me as a commentator. <laughs> We have to break this. I, I, when you asked me the question initially, I almost a answered with, with a question of myself. Is it okay to criticize Bolsonaro in, 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 in Brazil? He is perpetuating fires that are damaging the globe. Netanyahu, as far as I'm concerned, is perpetuating a political fire that is damaging the interest of the entire world in the Middle East between Israelis and Palestinians. You should criticize it. It's the wrong thing to do. Th that's it. And then once there is, an, I think, there's enough criticism, enough uh, international outrage at this, the it will actually dilute, I think, the wrong argument that criticizing Israel is is akin to anti-Semitism. So is support for Israel a Republican or a Democratic issue? Support. <laughs> I, I think that support for Israel is a bipartisan issue. I think that everyone should support Israel. I, I always mean, thought it was until recently. Go it, ahead. It, sh it should be. Um, you know, I'm I'm a dual citizen. I'm I'm an Israeli patriot. I love Israel. I go there three times a year. I live in the United States now. My family is there. My fan my friends are there. I love Israel. I love the principles. I love the ideals upon it uh, upon which it was established. I know that there is still a great deal of love here in the United States for those ideals and for what Israel should be. And I would love to see that grow. Unfortunately, there are forces in Israel who are blocking that, who are working day and night in order to diminish that kind of affinity that I think the people of the, the people of the United States have for Israel and the the ideals upon it which it, it upon which it was established so, so of course I'm getting to the, the fact that Donald Trump particularly is now trying to make this a partisan issue and we yeah. know how how he said it we've heard it so many times when he talked about this disloyalty in my opinion you vote for a Democrat you're being very disloyal to Jewish people, and you're being very disloyal to Israel. And only weak people would say anything other than that. So I don't want to assume too much, Deborah, but I might guess that sometime in your lifetime you might have voted as an American Jew for a Democrat. Um, what do you think when Donald Trump says you're being disloyal to Israel, disloyal to America, or you're just totally ignorant? 
Well, without revealing anything about my personal <laughs> politics, I you know I should mention that uh, you know that APN is a nonpartisan organization. Yes, yes. Uh, but it is you know we know that seventy to eighty percent of American Jews vote for the Democratic Party in the twenty eighteen midterms. It was seventy nine percent voted for Democratic candidates uh, in congressional mm-hmm. races. So basically, we just heard Donald Trump call. Roughly 80 percent of the American Jewish population disloyal. Uh, And that's absolutely, absolutely shocking. I mean, uh, to call any to call any American population, Jewish or otherwise disloyal for an American president to do that, uh, you know, is is mind blowing. Um, And, you know, we should add what is what's amazing here is that uh, we've seen Democratic politicians attacked uh, for perpetuating anti-Semitic tropes, including the well-known dual loyalty trope, right, that says right. that uh, Jews cannot be loyal to the country uh, in which they are citizens. They are, you know, they're inherently rootless cosmopolitans, uh, either loyal uh, to some sort of transnational uh, movement um, or to Israel. Uh, so we've heard, you know, attacks against Democratic politicians, specifically, obviously, I'm talking about Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib. And here we see the president of the United States clearly embracing the dual loyalty trope in a way that that we never saw from those two Democratic congresswomen. And it's it's just absolutely mind boggling. And you might want to get into this. But, you know, let me just say that the target audience for that was not American Jews, right? No. This is not an effort to try to win over more American Jews who are 2% of the population of the United States to support Donald Trump. We are not the target audience for that kind of mm-hmm. attack. Yeah. No, I, I, I know you know, <laughs> and you're, you're indicating whom he's after, Ori. He's his target for the clearly American evangelicals. Without right? a doubt. Without right. a doubt. And and that's one of the things that's that's so enraging about this. I, I have to say, we would have been as enraged and as offended if a Democratic president would have said that about Republicans, Republic, Jews for, for voting Republican. This is something that we, as as Americans who are advocating for support for Israel and for peace for Israel, we are um, one of one of the main issues that we are concerned about is that this maintain. Uh, a bipartisan issue, a non-political issue, or a non-partisan issue. So the fact that he, as Deborah said, not only um, partisanized it, political in terms of political partisanship, but also um, uh, made this, you know, bowed back to evangelicals in such a crude way is is really incredibly offensive. One thing that I've never understood. Um, is that the evangelical support for Israel and Israeli acceptance of their support, you know. Um, it, to me, there's a contradiction here because the evangelicals really, what, what I, when I read them and listen to them, they really want Armageddon to happen soon because that means the rapture will happen when all those who believe in Christ will rise up to heaven. But those who don't, including Jews, will be left behind to burn and be destroyed. I mean, what's the connection here? And why don't the Israelis or Jews understand that and reject that? It's really interesting. I mean, in, I know I'm, I'm familiar with the uh, Israeli debate about this issue. And on the Israeli political arena, for a lot of years, there was a debate of whether to make common cause with evangelicals or not. One school said we should wholeheartedly. They support us. Let's accept them. Who cares about their, you know? <laughs> who cares about their rapture? Yeah, huh? who cares about their religious agenda? We're non-religion. We're not. In the a, end, we'll see who's right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you go up or you yeah, don't. Exactly. Right? And the other school said, "Hey, hey, hey, not not so not so quickly. This is this is a, a very touchy thing. This is a very sensitive thing. You shouldn't you should be careful about who you go go to bed with." And 
to my regret, uh, the 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 former rather than the, than the latter is mm -hmm. now uh, prevailing in Israel, and it it's it's very dangerous. I think very dangerous. It's not just an Israeli government decision. Um, one thing that I found very interesting in uh, in the last couple of years, part of part of my job at APN uh, is to attend the annual APAC policy conference. And I found it fascinating to see the way that APAC, which is the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, uh, the the biggest, strongest, most well known um, pro Israel lobby uh, of a very, um, I would say, certainly conservative hue. Uh, their mandate is to support the policies of the Israeli government. Um, the way that they have wholeheartedly uh, made common cause with evangelical Christians. It's been fascinating what, when I've gone to those policy conferences to go to panels that are devoted entirely to Christian evangelical support for Israel, uh, and to you know, and to and in fact, I've asked questions. I, I you know see as part of yeah. my role to to you know be a troublemaker and ask questions. And I've asked these uh, these Christian Zionists, what about Christian Palestinian populations in? Uh, both in Israel, in the occupied territories. What about the way that they are discriminated against by the Israeli government? Uh, you know, does this does this trouble you? And and it you know it it doesn't. Dispensationalism, their own mm -hmm. cr you know brand of Christian theology, overrides everything. It's fascinating and uh, not particularly good for the Jews ultimately. Right. And Jim Jeffress, I think that's how you pronounce his name. One of the evangelical ministers was. Uh, invited by President Trump, Benjamin Netanyahu was right there to speak at the opening of the new U.S. Uh, embassy in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And, and, and he's a big, he's one of the main proponents of the rapture. Oh, theory, absolutely. Theory. And not only him, you also had uh, Pastor John Hagee as well, right. uh, who is the head of what is actually uh, the biggest pro-Israel organization, I should say, the biggest pro-Israel organization in the country now is not an American Jewish organization. It's KUFI, Christians United for Israel, uh, which has grown explosively. It's only about hmm. 10 years old. And it is now, you know, it's got millions of members uh, because obviously there's a much bigger Christian evangelical population to draw from in this country than than a Jewish one. Before we take a break, in talking about what I, we might term phony anti-Semitism, there are... Evidences, evidence of an incidence, real incidents of real dangerous anti-Semitism uh, in this country today. Um, that must concern you as well. Definitely. And, and we, we see it all over. And it's something that is um, uh, threatening. And one of the things that... that Charlottes, threatening, Charlottesville, Charlottesville comes to mind. One of the things that, that is Pittsburgh. threatening about it, and, and that is where, unfortunately, I see the government of Israel playing into mm. this is the um the the hybrid the new hybrid politics uh that put together religion and and politics and that's that's one of the things that worries me the most about evangelicals going back to that uh, topic for for a moment is uh not just the symbolics of it and you know the foreign ideology and so on it's the bringing the religious content into politics and into decision making for many years the Israeli government was very pragmatic and took decisions on the basis of pra pragmatism, what is security, what is, you know, international relations and things like that. Um, today, more and more, and a great part of it is because of opening the door to religious extremists, both Jewish and uh, Christian here in the United States, is the uh, marring the, 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 of, of the uh, political decision-making by religious content. Yeah, we're supposed to have a wall uh, in this country called the separation of church and state, which is aimed at preventing that, of course. Here it's porous and Israel, it doesn't exist. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a good way to put it. I want to say a word about this real anti-Semitism, anti um, which, I mean... I come from uh, from a family. My my mother's side of the family was wiped out in the Holocaust. My grandparents were Holocaust survivors. My mom was born in a di displaced persons camp in Germany after the war. Um, and to for me, having grown up in the United States and and having been so 
blessed with the absence of any of that kind of experience that, you know, that my grandparents went through to, to see a resurgence of, and let's be clear, it's white nationalist anti-Semitism in the United States that has led to multiple shootings in synagogues since Donald mm -hmm. Trump became president is, is absolutely terrifying. And let's be really clear that these people have been in, that these terrorists have been encouraged and inspired by our president from the White House. And w getting back to this, you know, to the U.S.-Israel issue, I think what is an, an addition on this that is so upsetting to American Jews is that Benjamin Netanyahu and the Israeli government have seen it as their job to try to absolve Donald Trump for any responsibility for what's going on in the United States. And I refer you after the after the massacre in the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh, who greeted mm -hmm. Donald Trump when he went to pay his respects? Was it a member of the American Jewish community? No, the American Jewish community had no interest in, in I mean, the in fact, the majority of American Jews assigned Donald Trump responsibility for what happened there. It was the Israeli ambassador to the United States, Ron Dermer, who greeted the president when he showed up in Pittsburgh. And when you have those massacres in Pittsburgh and Poway and California. So the official state government of official government of Israel basically this, this blessing Donald Trump, blessing yes. Donald Trump, right? Rather than speaking out against anti-Semitism in the United States, the fan, fan, the flames of which are fanned by Donald Trump. You, in fact, have Netanyahu with his extremely close and com totally dysfunctional relationship with Donald Trump, basically trying to absolve him of any responsibility. And we saw that as well with the disloyalty comments. Was there any attempt by the Israeli government, by Netanyahu or otherwise, to say, Listen, good friend Donald Trump, you are way out of line. Absolutely not. Nothing. It's it's an incestuous relationship, and 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 involved in this is the other ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Israel. I hope we'll have a chance to talk about that too, because there is a, there's a real danger here. Bill Press talking with Deborah Shushan and Ori Neer of Americans for Peace Now. If you'd like to hear the entire interview, visit BillPressShow.com. And that's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Richard D. Collenberg, Joshua A. Douglas, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.